Denver Riggleman was the Republican congressman of the 5th District of Virginia. He was also the data analyst of the January 6th committee and even wrote a New York Times bestseller on the subject called The Breach. Denver's now being featured in a documentary called Against All Enemies, currently streaming on Apple TV. Oh, and he's an award-winning whiskey maker too. Today, Denver came on the show to talk about a record that reminds him of the most important man in his life. Here's my chat with Denver Riggleman. Hey, what's on your record player? What's on your record player? Baby, I want to hear it. Hey, what's on your record player? What's on your record player? Why won't you tell me? It's on a need to know basis because I need to know. So the choice that you made to talk about this morning was the Billy Swan tune, I Can Help. How did you arrive at that? Oh, my gosh. So my, my, my grandparents lived on Union Mill Road in Centerville, Virginia, Doug. And, um, you know, my, my grandfather was a huge fan of all kinds of music. But, you know, he listened to, I don't know, boy, Washington, D.C. people, 98.7 WMZQ. Um, that was his favorite channel, right? The country channel here, 98.7 WMCQ. Um, so, but he loved, you know, the Conway Twitties, uh, loved the George Jones and things like that. Sure. So I was a little, you know, so I'm a kid, right? This is God, brother. It's late seventies, probably hmm. 78, 79. And he had a, and I didn't know my grandfather had a 45 collection. And so I'm, I'm in the back rec room where we watched, you know, Pittsburgh Steelers was his favorite, you know, football team where he always watched the games back there. You know, Redskins were number two because he was the governor of the Centerville Moose Lodge and the Redskins like to go drink there. But anyhow, I was in the back and I'm looking at 45s and I just played them on the little, I mean, 90, 78 and 79. I wish I could, I could describe what that record player looked like. You know, it could, it could fit 32s and 45s and, you know, you sort of had to hand push the thing over there. It didn't have a button, you know, it was just older. But I remember I saw this record and it was Billy Swan. And I put the record on and I remembered vaguely hearing that song on the radio, but that first guitar riff of Billy Swan's I Can Help was just, I listened to that as a kid. I, Doug, I had to listen to it a thousand times. It, 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 it stuck with me. And even today, you know, here I am 54, just turned 54. And when you asked me, asked me that question, the first thing was, I thought finding I Can Help by Billy Swan was one of the coolest finds I ever found at a eight or nine, as an eight or nine year old and just played the shit out of it. Now, what was going through your mind when you when you heard it the first time, like in your little like in your little kid mind? Because that song came out when you were, yeah, I was four. I was born March seventeenth, nineteen seventy. So, on but, Saint um, yeah, yeah, Saint Patty's Day, and um, but it, not to be completely nostalgic, um, but it reminded me of my grandfather. Um, you know, my dad had left when I was pretty young. Um, and, you know, I was with my mom and, and stepdad and, you know, I saw my dad intermittently, great guy, you know, um, but, you know, not that involved in the first eight to 10 years of my life. And, um, my grandfather was really the major father figure in my life. And my grandfather was always helping everybody, a very quiet, strong, stoic type, you know, he was also, you know, a man's man, right. Never complained. I, you know, it, I, it, even later in his life after his heart attack. You know, he'd, he'd walk back and forth to work and he'd be gassed, you know, and he's like, hey, you know, God's protecting me anyway, whatever. If I die on the walk, you know, that's what happens. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's just how he was wired. And sure. but I just but strong, you know, he, he bent sheet metal. His forearms look like Popeye, um, massively physically imposing and even five, eight, five, nine, just his arms. Right. Just from years of bending sheet metal. I mean, he, and when he grabbed you, he wore like a size 15 ring. His fingers were like God dang kielbasa sausages. And so when you, you know, he would squeeze your hand. Um, and plus he taught me how to box a little bit and fight. Um, but he was always there for me. And so that song reminded me of my grandfather. And I think that's why, you know, Billy Swan, I can help, you know, I immediately thought of my grandfather and what he did for our family and, and the sacrifices he made, but also just the massive mountain of a dude he was. Do you still have the record? I don't. I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. I think my grandmother does. So we were up in, in the attic about four or five years ago, and I remember seeing all those 45s. You know, the first thing I thought of was Billy Swan. And it's yeah. just so weird. That is stuck in my crawl for, God, 45 years now. You know that guy played bass for Chris Christopherson? That's how he What? Was. Yeah. So Billy Swan played bass for Chris Christopherson and then just wrote, tunes for other people because one of them had taken off and that's like the only hit he has 
And then he goes back to playing with Chris Christopherson and various <laughs> other bands. Like, and he's that that was just his thing. Like, ah, well, I got one. That's cool, you know. But he's like real cool about it. And uh, he was performing all the way up to two thousand uh, two thousand three. Oh my gosh! Well, I looked at the B side. I was looking at what was it? What a woman wants. I was listening to some of the other Billy Swan songs. I'm like, damn, this guy was good. You know, he, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't music like that had all like there was no way. I don't think he could ever match the riff of I Can Help. Right? No. Um, it was just so good. But the other songs, I'm like, damn, you could just listen to this and sip a bourbon and just be looking around like, and this guy was cool, you know, yeah. and just really smooth really cool sort of, I don't know what do we call it, Funkabilly or, or just like country rock, or I don't even know, but it's, it's just so. Because it needs to be, if it isn't. That's the first time I heard that. So what, yeah. Funkabilly? Funkabilly, yeah. Is that a thing? Yeah, I, it's always what I call that type of music. I don't, I made it up myself because when people are like, what is I like, I like Funkabilly, you know. I like Funkabilly. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to I'm going to say that when anyone asks me about music, period. I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a Funkabilly aficionado. A oh, Funkabilly. You just don't want to take, you know, you don't want to say it really quick and that N and Funk change to a C and then all of a sudden that changes the complete, you know, meaning of yeah, what you're trying to say. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> now you're talking about weird things with goats. But, yeah. you know, so, but yeah, so, um, but no, that's why Billy Swan, that song, it's so weird when you ask me, man. I, it, it was the, it not only was a microsecond, it was like, bam. And listen, I found a lot of records. I remember going through my mom's stuff, you know, and them having like the uh, LP for T for the Tiller Man with Cat Stevens. They had everything by the Steve Miller band, old freaking stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, and, you know, so there are other things I found. I'm like, damn, the original big, you know, the T for the Tiller Man by Cat Stevens, which, which is just, I don't even want to tell you about the memories of that and Steve Miller band because, you know, my parents were upstairs and when that music was playing, you didn't go in the room, you know. So anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dear Lord. laughs> don't when Steve Miller's playing. No, no, not not that. You know, you don't want to take the peaches off that tree. But Billy Swan, man, it's just freaking insane. Well, you make musical references all the time, like you know. So, like when we talk, like you'll and you'll pull one out of nowhere, like, and I have to stop mid conversation. Like, did you just reference prong? Like <laughs> prong. The Beastie Boys. One day you were just like, "Yeah, it was Rollins." I was listening to the Rollins band. Like, what? Like, <laughs> like all right, what are you gonna pick? Because I don't know. Yeah, you don't know. Like, you're a mixed bag. The oddest thing Denver Riggleman can do is pitch one down the middle and be like Billy Swan. I'm like, huh? But <laughs> the story is great. That's really, really great. Uh, I don't know what you expected because I know you don't know what to expect from me. But again, I it's know. memories, right? It's it's really what affects you. Listen, the Billy Swan song, and people can be like, there's no way he's going to say The Billy Swan, Swan song is what I wanted to be as a man. And I think it's not only the song, but but the relationship I have with my grandfather, the fact I found him in the rec room and Union Mill Road in Centerville, Virginia. Um, it's just, when I heard the Billy, I'm like, I, that's what I want to be. Um, and I know that, so that's really weird. But really, the Billy Swan song to me encapsulates what a real man is, and you know, and 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 again, it goes back to my grandfather. And um, the fact is, I don't know what I would have done without him in my life, especially as a youngster. Um, he taught me toughness, and I know that's that's something I don't know if that happens as much today. But he taught me about quiet toughness, and, and you know, and said some other things to me in his life that Billy, the Billy Swan song. I remember some of his incredible. Uh, advice which was so weird like one time we were up um on the mountain i was 15 years old and we're cutting wood and right. uh and he always his favorite thing was a pepsi and a zero bar if anybody's had a he, he would eat the zero bar and then drink a pepsi real can quick and it was what, like a, can you explain what a zero bar is like a zero bar is the zero bars where the white chocolate is on the outside and the dark chocolates on the inside it so sounds zero like i've never seen it but yeah oh god they're delicious i still when i see a zero bar and a pepsi i'll get that to take me back to those times in the mountains and and you know so zero bar of pepsi and billy swan man i'm back in history brother you know i'm back in nostalgia times but he told me one time we were sitting there and he goes hey boy he's like uh you know you're 15 now now by the time he was 14 he was logging he got hit by a tree at 14 and broke his back so oh. you talk about tough oh jesus he said well it bent me over and my head was stuck between my knees i said there might be an issue so anyway so 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. That's, that's awesome. Because they straightened me up, and I'm like, I don't know if I can walk. Because I don't know if they cracked something, but I just I laid in bed a few months, let it heal, and figured maybe I wanted to get a job not cutting trees. That's, <laughs> there you go. Think about that sentence and the toughness, right, um, yeah, yeah. of that. Yeah. Because you know, that was, you know, 1948, 1949 when that happened to him. So anyhow, gosh, so we were up there in the mountain, and Dougie goes, uh, he goes, what do you want to grow up to be? What, what are you thinking? You know, you're, you're sophomore in high school now. You know, and he, he had quit. He got kicked out in the 10th grade because he beat up a guy for making pair, fun of his pants. So he never finished high school. Mm. So I said, well, Grandpa, you know, in my work, I want to do something that's fun. You know, I want to do something that I like, you know, and, and I want to work at something I really enjoy. Here's his sentence. He goes, well, if work was fun, they'd call it fun and not work. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> Man, yeah. <laughs> Is this the same grandfather that you wrote about in your book? Yeah. So he's the one. The book is called Bigfoot. It's complicated. Now tell that story briefly if you could. Oh, gosh, Doug. Oh, man, you're you're doing it to me here. This is great. Um, Yeah, my grandfather, when I was 10 years old, we used to take a walk up to this place called the Bull's Head, which was up at the top of the – it was right on the edge of the Monongahela National Forest. We had 143 acres in West Virginia. I was 10 years old, 1980. Um, my grandfather was a big time hunter and he would always carry his 30, 30, or he would carry a 22 rimfire when we had these, you know, these, these walks, but that day he didn't, you know, he said, Hey, let's walk up to the bull's head. This is probably October. So it's getting close to deer season. And he wasn't letting me hunt yet. I had to carry a stick pretend it was a rifle for safety for years before he let me hunt. So, um, so we're walking up to the bull's head. It's about a two mile walk, heck of a hike. I mean, it's up right into the Monongahela, into the mountains. We get the bullhead. They have a massive spring that feeds all of the cattle downstream. There's this pipe, this pipe that ran all, we call it the spring line, that ran all the way down the mountain. So we go up where the spring started and drink right out of the spring, Doug. I mean, think about that. It's just amazing, right? Then we would go, and my grandfather, since we were so smart, we'd play a game where we would just throw rocks down the mountain to see how far they would fall, and we would see who could win because that's what you do in West Virginia. That's the smartest our games are. You have chess and rock throwing, right? So anyway, so so, so we got boulder chucking. So we're boulder chucking right down the mountain and having a great time. Well, we're getting close to the fence line where the property to go to the bullhead to go onto our 143 acres. And we're getting close to the fence. My grandfather stops, looks up in the mountain. And and in October, you still have mountain laurel. So the sun is hitting the mountain laurel. Mountain laurel is very reflective. It's really hard to see. So you're you're sort of glinting into the evening sun as it's going off the mountain laurel, laurel. And my grandfather goes, well, there's something up there. He goes, hold on, boy. So he jumps up on this stump that had been cut off near the fence so he can get a, a better viewpoint or, you know, vantage point up into the, into the mountain wall. And he just turns around and goes, run. It was that, I, to this day, I mean, it wasn't like he's like, oh, my God, run, you know. Jesus, there's a big monster killing us, going kill us, you know. It, it was like, uh, uh, you need to run. For him to have even said that word had to be, like, mm-hmm. absolutely terrifying. Terrifying. How top top he was. I mean, I was instead of opening the gate, I'm trying to climb over the gate. My grandfather literally just flicks me over the gate. I land on the other side and he just opens it calmly. And my grandfather, remember, he was only 36 when I was born. So he's 46. I'm 10. This guy can run. I'm like, what the? And I'm fast. I played football, you know, so I'm flying down the mountain. My grandfather's right beside me. He's like, and and he's running. He's like, come on, boy. I mean, and he's not, there's no real excitement. Right. It, you know, he's just, we get down to the, you know, to the trailer. He goes in there and he brings out his 30 30. And I mean, he's like, thup, 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 gets right. over there and he's looking up there, open sights, looking up in the mountain. Now it's 100 yards of cleared land up into the wood line behind our green trailer. So he's looking up there and I grabbed the 22. I'm 10 years old. I know how to shoot. And I, I load a little single shot in there and put a couple shells in there. Like, yeah. you know, I couldn't have stopped a squirrel probably. What a dumbass. But, you know, I felt good at 10. But um, we sat there for a good time, and he looked up there. He goes, well, it must have been nothing. So 2015, 2014, the year before he dies, he's 80 years old, and uh, he's reading his Bible uh, at the table. And his prop- now he's in Petersburg, West Virginia. doesn't live in Centerville, Virginia anymore. And right. I sit down, and I had written the book, and I, it wasn't published yet. And I said, Grandpa, tell me about that day. He goes, oh, I don't remember those things. I said, you don't remember you telling me to run and 
pretty much throw me over a fence and then say yeah. that there was something in the woods? He goes, well, yeah, I guess I, I got some recollection. And that is his word. I, and it's, buddy, it could be a movie. And he goes, you know, there's something big and black because I thought it was a bear. He goes, but it moved funny. I said, oh. He goes, it moved real funny. I said, what do you think it was? He goes, I don't know. It was just a, just mighty peculiar. Wow. And, you know, so that, you know, and I kept pushing him, but he goes, I, I just don't want to talk about it. Oh. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So he goes, you know, I just, it was just something that I uh, thought we needed to, to be cautious about. That's sure. what he would say, because that's the word he used. You know, we, I just thought we need to be cautious, and it was best that you were safe. That's wow. him. And I can oh. even do his his expressions, you know, everybody says me and my grandfather have a lot in common. Um, you know, and so, but that's what happened, buddy. Same grandfather from Billy Swan to incredible advice in my life to thinking he was saving me from something bizarre in the woods. One more question. Because of a political opponent, your interest in Bigfoot had become national news, right? You're wearing a Bigfoot mm -hmm. hat now. It's such an obvious question, but like, do you think that experience is what set you on the path to be inter so interested in Bigfoot. Because you interviewed the people who made the, the original Bigfoot tapes. People have you on their movie sets and call you a Bigfoot expert. Like, it's not a hobby. No. It, well, you know, it, it it's interesting because my grandfather also told me a story about a massive 50-foot red snake with horns that him and his grandfather saw in the 1930, uh, 1950s, early 50s. And I'm like... Yeah. No, you know, and I and I wonder if people mistake things. The thing is, I don't believe in Bigfoot, which people I think would be surprised. I'm wearing this. This hat was sent to me anonymously. I remember, I think, or a gift because of the because I was accused of Bigfoot erotica, based on my book Bigfoot. It's complicated, which was about Bigfoot believers and the fact that they had taken Bigfoot belief to a religious sort of thing and really defined their lives in a bizarre. And they hate each other. Different Bigfoot belief systems. However, your question is so good. Because my grandfather is the one who got me in really interested in how do you prove things that are almost unprovable. And I think it's probably the first time, even at 10, where I started to question religion, too. You think about that one experience has put me down this path of what are facts and belief. And then if you have somebody you respect so much who thinks he saw something mighty peculiar in the woods, what does that, what does that do? I know this has all started with Billy Swan and I can help, but you know, what happens if you allow yourself, my grandfather would not allow himself to call it what he thought it was because he did not have the, it's almost like he didn't have the words, Doug. Um, yeah. And that's really bothersome. That man would not lie. He is a, this the paragon of this stoicism of hard work and never complain and, Whatever happens to you, you keep it to yourself. Whatever pain you have, you keep it to yourself. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, that's toxic masculinity. No, that's that's a man who just didn't want people to know what he was feeling um, right. because he thought that's how he should be. And that's just called being a man at that time. And I, that's how I want to be today. I, if I could be like anybody in the way that I conduct myself, it's like my grandfather. Now, that ship has sailed because I'm very outspoken. But I can be truthful and have integrity. Yeah. That is something that he had. And even when people are pissed, I'm not going to back down. And he would not. I watched him fight. Him and my dad at the Moose Lodge took on five people when I was nine years old. And I watched all of it. My grandfather was a brawler. My dad was a brawler. Um, not in as good a way. <laughs> so long stories. But, you know, I grew up in that atmosphere. And, um, I mean, it's just the way it is. But to, to, to have a man like that, to say that he saw something mighty peculiar, and he doesn't even want to name it, that's something. Mm -hmm. It's something. So what was it? And to this day, I wish I could go back. I, I wish I could go back, you know, and, 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 and head up into those woods. Maybe I would have been torn apart. <laughs> but I would love to have seen what that damn thing was that he didn't think was a bear. That's it. That's the, you know, and that really got me onto this. How do you prove things? And I think it's really what actually defines me today is that experience. You're correct. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I know you're going to be back a lot because you you, you have a, a whole catalog in your head of different <laughs> genres of music. And, and I know I'm interested to see where those go. Oh, my God, man. My God. I remember there's another song one day 
God, I, the first time I played strip poker in a single wide trailer was 1982. <laughs> 12 years old. <laughs> So that's that we're teasing the next Denver Riggleman up. Yeah, and, and that that's a Johnny Cash song. So yeah, yeah. so I, I'm not going to say it, but uh, I remember that song was playing, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm playing strip poker with my cousins because that's what you do in West Virginia in a single wide trailer while listening to Johnny Cash. So there you go. That that's just a little bit of a. That didn't come out of my mouth. You said it. <laughs> <laughs>